Amen. So as we continue on in our study of the book of Mark, we are, we are in Mark chapter 10, verses 1 to 12. There is a considerable issue here in our text, and it is the issue of marriage, divorce, and remarriage. I can't say that I was looking forward to this message as we looked at the book of Mark, but I also, you need to know that my calling is to preach the whole counsel of God including the hard passages of the Bible. So, here we go. It is under the guidance of the Holy Spirit and under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit and the grace of God that we come to this text this morning. I know that this topic touches every one of us. So, whether you have been to weddings this summer and some of those weddings you kind of wonder, oh, I don't really feel like celebrating this wedding. Don't know if this is where I should be or... Um, you've struggled. I've talked to many of you. I've struggled with whether I should go to certain weddings and am I able to celebrate. So that's number one. Number two is you may have people around you, very close to you, that are struggling in their own marriages. And thirdly, you may be caught in a tough patch, a tough place in your marriage right now. And number four, maybe you've experienced divorce yourself and the pain that is associated with it. So my goal is to speak with as much compassion and love as possible. Certainly not intending to hurt you any further. Many have asked me for years this common question. What does Jesus think about marriage, divorce, and remarriage? People want to know. People who aren't even associated with God, they want to know. What does God think about this? And they understand that it is an issue that he's involved with. So, if we don't know the answer to this question, what does God, what does Jesus say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage, it's likely not good that you're going to give, good chance that you're going to give a good answer to people when they are in this crucial time period and they're vulnerable in life. And we often tend to give the world's advice here in this moment. But I want to tell you that it can be very different, our views on marriage, divorce, and remarriage, than the world, and it can be very destructive for us to tell them this is what God is saying when in fact he's not. So there are also questions that we need to navigate. Can I celebrate with this person who is entering into marriage? And am I dishonoring God by going and saying, I, I agree with what you're doing. You know, we may not realize, but the history of marriage is that when we are in, uh, involved in a marriage ceremony, we think, oh, I'm not really involved. I'm just going there. Come on. No, that's not the way it is. That's not the, what you're doing. You're going there to give credence to what is happening, to give support to what is happening. And do you know that if this, trouble, if this couple has trouble, it's all of us who are there to witness the vows that they made that we need to remind them of those vows. So that's marriage. That's the importance of what we do when it comes to marriage. So many of you would say, I don't know. I don't know what Jesus would say about marriage, divorce, and remarriage. Well, I'm going to encourage you to know. It really only takes 20 minutes of reading. It's really simple and straightforward. And I've put it on, for that reason, I've put it on the back of the bulletin insert. And I've also... Uh, included it with this message online. I trust I'm not going to have trouble with my throat. <coughs> Give me a second here. I got to get some help. <coughs> First point I want to make is that marriage is God's idea. Now, what we got happening here in this text is that there are crowds of people, they've come to Jesus, and they've come to him many times as we've gone through the book of Mark, and they've asked for his wisdom and his truth in many different situations. So no different today, the Pharisees actually came, it says in verse 2, and they tested him by asking, is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Just one second. Thank you. So sad... The Pharisees are actually more interested 
about what Jesus thinks about marriage. They don't, don't really, they're not really that concerned about it, but they're more interested in what he says about divorce. And you know, as we reflect on this question that they're asking, things haven't changed a whole lot in all of these years. Some synagogues taught that there was no divorce except for pornea, which means sexual immorality, sexual deviancy, or adultery. Sometimes I don't know if we know what those words mean these days. But in God's eyes, there is such a thing as sexual deviancy and adultery and sexual sin. Other, other synagogues were more liberal. And so they would say if your wife burns the food, if she doesn't iron your shirts, if she doesn't do what she's supposed to be doing. Marriage was all about men back then, by the way. Uh, it's unfortunate that's the way it was, but that's what was happening. So a wife could be kicked to the curb simply for those simple things. Very sad. Today in our world, <coughs> excuse me, you could take any group, any church, and get a variety of reasons that people should and could obtain a divorce. And sadly, many problems arise in marriage, and the response of many is to get a divorce. In fact, the Statistics Canada would say that 38% of marriages end in divorce. But then you got to think of all the relationships where marriage is not really officially entered into, but couples live together. Well, that's a whole lot worse. And the average live-in relationship lasts about 18 months. So, there you've got, paints a picture of our society. And many are saying, why is our society in the mess it's in? Why are our marriages in such mess? And we ask those questions, and they're great questions to ask. And today, hopefully, you're going to get an answer from Jesus. But this is a test for Jesus, and it's still a test today. And people will often ask, where do you stand on this issue or that issue? And depending on what you answer, they will decide of whether they're going to accept you or cancel you as a church or as a pastor or as a friend. And sadly, they may not realize that actually the one that they've canceled is not the pastor or the church, but it's Jesus himself. And so, remember, I, I need you to remember that this world is a place of testing. Jesus is testing us every day. We are making a decision of whether we're going to follow Jesus in this situation or we're just going to kind of run it ourselves. And those decisions that we make on a day-to-day -day basis will all culminate one day on our eternal place that we are going to live. So, Jesus replied. He said, what did Moses command you? And they said, Moses permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. They love Moses. And you know what? Sometimes we love people who author books and people who preach and people who say things. And we sometimes would maybe take their advice even more than we would take Jesus' advice. I hope that's not the case with us here, but it can be. In Jesus' teaching, he said, yeah, Moses, he's a great guy. But there's one greater that we need to consider, and we need to consider God, and we need to consider what God has said. So he said, in the beginning, and we come to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 6, it says, at the beginning of creation, God made them male and female. And obviously, he's quoting Genesis 1. And God said, let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness. And then we flip to chapter 2 of Genesis, and he talks about how he created man and woman. And the Lord God said, it is good, not good, that a man, man is to be alone. The man is alone. I will make a helper suitable for him. And so the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. And while he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs and then closed up the place with flesh. Then the Lord God made the woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought it to the man, and the man said, and you need to know that in the original language here, it's kind of like this whole thing about, wow, wow, you took that out of my, you took a rib and fashioned that, wow, and Adam in his explanation, he goes, this is bone of my bones, this is flesh of my flesh, well, I'm going to call her a woman. For she has taken out a man. 
That is why man leaves his father and mother is united to his wife, and they will become one flesh. Well, that's where Jesus picked up in chapter 10, verses 7 to 9. And he said, referring to this passage, he said, For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother, and listen to these words, he will be united, united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. So they are no longer two, but they're one flesh. Therefore, what God has joined together, let no one separate. I don't know if that's our thinking today. Our world kind of says, you know what, you'll hang together as long as you do, and when it's over, it's over, and ah, don't worry about it. No, that's not how God looks at it. He says, you're one flesh. And what we see in these two passages of Scripture is that God, marriage is God's idea. It's not man's idea. Mankind did not come up with marriage, and, that, and what that means is that mankind cannot redefine marriage. God has designed marriage to be between one man and one woman, and there is no such thing as homosexual marriage, or is there any such thing as polygamous marriage in God's eyes, or whatever other perversion that you want to say that God is for. It's the way it is. And this is exactly what Jesus is pointing to when the Pharisees asked him about divorce. Jesus points out that since God joins together a man and a woman into this one flesh marriage reunion, verse 9, he says, Therefore, what God has joined together, let no man separate. God sees marriage as very important, and he sees it that we see it as one. Very important in his eyes. God wants to be involved in our marriage relationship. God is the fuel that marriage runs on. God holds marriage in high regard. In Ephesians 5, 22 and 23, he compares it to his relationship to the church. I don't think we get that relationship either. We don't get the fact that God who is the groom and we are the bridegroom and how important that relationship is. And so I think we take advantage and we, we don't treat the church the way we ought to. It's his bride. Marriage is one of the crowning acts of God's creation. I had a pastor here last night who made that statement. So that's marriage. So much more I could say on marriage. But let's go to number two because this passage, he's talking about something else as well. Marriage is not God's, or sorry, divorce is not God's intention. How's that? In fact, it's a departure from the purpose of God. By the time Jesus came to earth, the standards of marriage instituted by God were in an awful state of disrepair. And we may think, oh no, I thought they were in disrepair today. Yeah, you're right, they are. They're in a tough spot today. And Jesus, but Jesus moves to the heart of what's wrong. Many people around this world are saying, what's wrong with our society? What's wrong with marriage? What's wrong with our kids? What's wrong with these things? Well, Jesus said there's a lot wrong with what's going on. And the Pharisees were talking about a simple certificate of divorce. And they said marriage permitted a man to write a certificate of divorce and send her away. Now, the Pharisees thought that it was about a piece of paper, a certificate. And the reason for divorce didn't matter. Jesus said, you've got it all backwards. The Pharisees were emphasizing the method of divorce, but not the reason. Jesus came emphasizing the reason, and wasn't so the, the method wasn't that important. And so to illustrate this, and to see how crazy this might be, there's a law that requires sex offenders to register and update any and, any, any and all personal information to the local police of where they're living. However... This does not imply that the government approves of sex offenders as long as they register with the police. See how crazy that is? No, the intent of this requirement is to protect the potential victims of sex crimes. Now, Jesus' intent was to protect women who were being kicked to the curb and thrown to the street. Likewise, even if God's law says, if you divorce your wife, you must write her 
a certificate of divorce, it does not imply that divorce is morally good or a neutral thing. This is what the law of the land had come to. Now, fast forward this to today. Sounds very familiar with what they're talking about. And we look at the same certificate of divorce that the government issues and think that it's the magic ticket to freedom. I've literally had people in my office say, if I can just get that divorce, you know what? All this, my past will all be wiped. And that person will be wiped out of my life. Simply not true. It's not that easy. And you'll be tied in that relationship for many, many years. Maybe in this world, that might be true, but it's not true in the kingdom of God. It grieves my heart when a spouse threatens to divorce their partner by the world's standards without considering what God says. This happens, I think, too often in Christian relationships. And some will just stomp away and say, I just want a divorce. Hold on to what you're thinking there. Because what you're thinking is, I don't care what God says, I just want to get rid of you. Wow. You're going to dismiss God and his word just like that because of your anger? you got some issues here, buddy. And I grieve when I hear people say those kinds of things in their own marriage. You know what? We may secure a certificate of divorce, but in God's eyes, you may still be married. Mankind's certificate of divorce doesn't trump God's standard and never will. Here's an example. And it's an example that Craig preached about here just a little while ago in, in John the Baptist in Mark chapter 6. Or you could look at it in Matthew chapter 14, 1 and 2. You'll remember that John the Baptist spoke against Herod because Herod had stole his brother Philip's wife. And it's interesting that the Holy Spirit didn't refer to to her as Herod's wife, but referred to her as Philip's wife. Because the certificate that Herod had got when he stole his his brother's woman and married her made no difference to God. You need to know that marriage is very close to God's heart. And he says, your relationship to me will be very important in your relationship to to your wife or to your spouse. And so really the way God is looking at this is God is at the top of your relationship and man is on one side, woman is on the other. But those three are together. When I treat my wife poorly, do you know who I answer to? To God. Because it's the Holy Spirit who may say to me, oh, that's pretty arrogant. Maybe you need to apologize for what you said. And in my trumped up pride, I'm not apologizing. I got to answer to him. And that's what we have in this, in this story in Malachi chapter 2, this part of scripture. <clears throat> you could, we start at verse 13. It says, another thing you do, there's, there's a relationship in the prophets saying, here's why God is not responding to you. Another thing you do, you flood the Lord's altar with tears. You weep and wail because he no longer looks with favor on your offerings or accepts them with the pleasure from your hands. And you ask, why? Well, the prophet said, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. Has not the one God made you? Has not the one God made you? You belong to him in body and spirit. And what does the one God seek? Godly offspring. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful to the wife of your youth. The man who hates and divorces his wife says the Lord, the God of Israel, does violence to the one he should protect, says the Lord Almighty. So be on your guard and do not be unfaithful. You have wearied the Lord with your words. You have, how have we wearied him, you ask? By saying, all who do evil are good in the eyes of the Lord and he is pleased with them. Or where is the God of justice? God is saying that marriage 
really fits in to your relationship with him. Now, it's interesting that Mark gives no reason to look for divorce. Zero. He said, if you get married, you're married for life. But Matthew gives what's known as the exception clause. So in Matthew 19 and Matthew 5, Jesus said this, I tell you that anyone who divorces his wife, except for marital unfaithfulness, that's a word called pornea, I'm going to talk about that a little bit again, and marries another woman, commits adultery. Why? Because in God's eyes, the only legitimate reason for divorce is that Greek word called pornea. And pornea means any kind of sexual deviancy. I could go through a whole list of things. But the tense of the verb is an ongoing deviancy. It's not stopping. And deviancy can be an adulterous situation. It can be, it can, it can be all sorts of deviancy on an ongoing, continual, unrepentant action. That's the only reason that you could secure a divorce. That's it. I want to move to our third point now. This hinges on what we just talked about. Remarriage should be approached with caution. The disciples were unfamiliar with and probably surprised by Jesus' teaching because it was pretty loose morals in terms of marriage in those days. And so in Mark chapter 10, 10 and 12, Jesus speaks about remarriage. And when they were in the house again, the disciples asked Jesus about this, and he answered, anyone who divorces his wife and marries another woman commits adultery against her. And if she divorces her husband and marries another man, she commits adultery. Pretty straightforward. Divorce isn't condoned, but it is allowed. And there are biblical grounds for divorce that allow for remarriage. And the answer is, is there biblical grounds for remarriage? Tentatively, yes. So when is remarriage permissible according to the Bible? Well, we have a couple of examples. Paul writes about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, 39 and 40. He says, a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives, but if, but if her husband dies, she is free to marry anyone she wishes. But listen to this, another exception clause, but he must belong to the Lord. In my judgment, she is happier if she stays as she is. <clears throat> what I think he's saying here is don't rush. Don't rush into marriage at any point in life. Whether it's your first marriage, whatever it is, don't rush. Then he picks it up again in verses 8 and 9. And he says, now to the unmarried, and there are some here, to the unmarried and to the widows, I say... It is, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I do. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry, for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. So again, Paul is saying, be cautious. And even common sense, the stats around us would say, would tell us second marriages have a higher failure rate than the first ones. Now, I never want to undo what the Spirit of God may do in your life, in your situation. But I'm not saying that to say that we don't go to the word. The word is always primary. So remarriage is permissible in the event of a spouse who has moved on with someone else sexually. That's what the Bible says, 1 Corinthians 7. Again, 12 to 16. Paul says, to the rest I say this. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified. And what that simply means is he's been set apart. She's been set apart for a special ministry through the one who knows Jesus and is responding to Jesus and is reacting like Jesus does. He's got a front row seat. She's got a front row seat to observe what's going on in this relationship. Through the wife. And the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through her believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. As it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let it be so. 
The brother or the sister is not bound in such circumstances. God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will save your husband? Or how do you know, husband, whether you will save your wife? Again, God is bringing this marriage relationship that is lived out today to an eternal place. Are you thinking about eternity when you think about your marriage? So when an adulterous relationship has brought about divorce, the party who is innocent of adultery has the right to remarry. Again, I tell you, this is serious stuff. And the conclusion the disciples come to in Matthew 19 in this parallel passage is similar. It says, the disciples said to him, if this is a situation between a husband and a wife, it is better not to marry i got to tell you that I've said that to many people. You're single. You're doing well. Are you sure that you want to live in this closest of all relationships in the world? Are you ready for this? Jesus replied, not everyone can accept this word, but only those to whom it is given. And what he's referring to, it's been given to those who are followers of Jesus. This is what he's saying. Now, what do we do as a church? We've got many people who in this, who in this society get married very fast and with their emotions. I'm infatuated with this person. I actually had a couple that came to me and said I was divorced in this church. And I said, well, tell me the story. And she actually said, uh, we were married less than 24 hours. We were married for 22 hours got to be kidding me like who performed that marriage like you really just it, were infatuated with one another you put no thought into this you were only together for a short time and got married and you blew out in no time in this society we don't put much into the marriage relationship it's often just an emotional affair i like the way you look so let's let's spend the rest of our lives together so how do we, well, let me read this. Let me read what the Book of Common Prayer says. It says, marriage is not by any to be entered into inadvisably or lightly, but reverently. What's that mean? With God. With God. Discreetly. Advised. Soberly. And in the fear of God. Looks a little bit different than some of the decisions that are being made today. But around here, we seek to help these young people who need to understand all of the rigors of marriage. And so as a church, we have premarital counseling, sorry, premarital mentoring. And in that relationship, we are putting a married couple who have been successful in their marriage. And we are putting them together with this pre-marriage couple. So six months, they are going to have to be in this relationship. So they will meet at least weekly. They will also meet usually after the, the marriage, the wedding is over, and meet and say, how you doing? And I'm hoping for the rest of their lives, they will be connected to help each other. And so we won't do marriages. <clears throat> right up front here, we won't do marriages that won't comply to that six-month time period. So if you've got some kids or you're here contemplating marriage and you're going to phone the church, you need to know that's what's coming. We won't do marriages outside of that kind of arrangement because we want you to understand all that's involved. Secondly, we will under no circumstance uh, marry people who are in the midst of fornication. That means they're living together, sleeping together. Those marriages have a very difficult time. And they figure, stats will say, big stats will say, about 4 to 6% of those will make it. The rest will fail if you start that way. So as a church, we're saying, we want marriage to work because it's very important to God. Let's do all we can. So how are we doing? Well, uh, that's, that, every church I've been in, that mentoring program has been going on for 35 years. And we have done 175 marriages, and only five have failed. 
that we know of. There's nobody that I've ever heard of that has better odds than that of helping keep marriage together. So we're doing all we can. And I pray that you are doing all you can to help people make those important decisions in life. Okay, let me bring this conclusion. Marriage, it's extremely rewarding. I tell my wife this quite a bit. I say, my life is just energized by you being a part of my life. I love marriage. I would never want to be any other way. But I also know, I also know it's tough. And you think sometimes, what was God thinking? It takes two people that are very different, very, very different. And I could go on and tell you all the ways that we're really quite different, the way we look at everything. But then he puts you into the most intimate of all relationships, one of the most intimate relationships. Okay, you guys go. Well, we all know what happens. It's not easy, but it's rewarding. I like this statement, you're not married to be happy, but you're married that you might learn to be holy. That's the way God looks at it. I love the fact that the Holy Spirit's in, in the relationship with us. God is there because sometimes I'm a rotten human being. And sometimes I got pride issues. And I need to say I'm sorry to my wife, but I'm too proud to do it. It's the Holy Spirit that won't let me go. And he says, oh, when are you going to get this right? When are you going to say what you need to say that would honor me? You're wrong. Even if you're not wrong. You need to take the lead to straighten this up. He makes me a better human being. That's what's needed in marriage. Secondly, our marriages need regular maintenance. So get, with a, get, a, get to a marriage retreat. See a counselor. Don't wait till the thing is completely, uh, you've kicked the stuffing out of each other, and then you try and go and get this thing together. It's not the time to do it. Work on the issues. Fight fair. Talk about it in your small group. You don't, you don't do counseling in your small group, but talk about some of these issues and help one another out in these different places. Number three, maybe you're here and you're divorced. And I want to tell you that you are not damaged goods simply because you're divorced and remarriage, remarried. Because God is gracious. He's loving he cares about the situation you're in. And what I would encourage you to do is go and find out maybe what you did or didn't do in the relationship and ask God to forgive you. His forgiveness is free for those who come and then begin to live the way he's called you to. And God will forgive. And I want to tell you that there's not a perfect person here. And even if you've been divorced and remarried, you're just like me. We're all in this. A couple of weeks ago, a couple of months ago, I preached a sermon on the unpardonable sin, the thing that you could never be forgiven for. And I'm not going to tell you what it is, but it's in May. I preached it in May 6 and 7, but it's not marriage and divorce. Number four, we live in a world where marriage will not be held in high esteem. Premarital sex is the way this world goes. Extramarital sex will not be discouraged by this world. We're it. We're representing what God thinks about marriage. And I want to encourage us to do that. Number five, I think it's important to remind us that marriage is God's idea. And that divorce is not God's intention. And that remarriage should be approached with caution. And may God give you the grace and the strength to show the world the beauty of marriage as God intended it to be. And that he can do in us what he can do in us if we simply just include him. So I just want to have a short prayer, then a blessing. God, we need your help. You have put us into this world. And you have put us into marriage and God I pray that you would help us we all need help and so I ask that you would fill us with your spirit that you would fill our marriage with your spirit bless your people with extraordinarily extraordinary marriages in Jesus name we pray amen so three things if you want to ask any questions I know for some this may not land well
That's okay. But let's talk about it. Secondly, if you want prayer for any issue at all, there's people that would love to pray for you here under the cross. And lastly, if you've come prepared to give and you say, where's the offering plate? Well, it's out at guest services, out in the foyer, little box with a lock on it. Just put your offering in there and we appreciate that. But I want to I wanna close out our service with a blessing. And I take you to number six, numbers six. And it basically says this, just stand with me. I think in that posture, we were able to receive what God wants to pour out upon us and expect him to bless you. Hold out our hands and say, God, I want it all. I need it all. So the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Amen. Thanks for coming. God bless you. Have a great weekend.